Happy Sunday, everyone. Hope you're having a great day. Today, I want to talk about how time and again, I have found myself at odds politically with my own church. I am a transplant to Utah. I grew up in San Diego, uh, went to high school, graduated high school, came to BYU and developed roots and kind of got stuck. And all growing up as a so-called California Mormon, we always you know, teased the Utah Mormons and thought Utah culture was weird and all these things. And so now I find myself, having been here now for 23 years, uh, having a bit more insight into this kind of weird, weird world of the church's kind of influence in and to some large degree control of the state of Utah. And when I started Libertas Institute uh, over a decade ago, um, I didn't really appreciate at the time the degree to which I was going to encounter um, my own church as an obstacle for uh, kind of restoring freedom and making sure that people had you know personal rights guaranteed and all these things. I, I didn't really um, contemplate the degree to which my church would be an obstacle uh, and what it would mean for me. So I want to talk a little bit about that today. I want to share some examples, actually several examples. I've been asked about these examples many times, uh, especially when the Prop 2 medical marijuana thing happened in Utah. I was always asked, I, I would allude to or mention, oh, this is not the first time, it won't be the last, that type of thing, where the church was exerting its political control. And people generally kind of know that or or understand, but don't always know detail. They don't always have uh, a, a deeper understanding uh, of examples that they can cite showing the church kind of meddling in politics in Utah. So uh, I'm going to share a few examples. I thought it would be useful to finally, uh, you know, be a bit more detailed than I have in the past. And I, I do this not to criticize the church, not to pick at a scab or any of these types of things. I do this because as you may know from past Sunday musings I've done, I have this deep desire to make sure that we can separate church culture from you know worship of Christ and pure doctrine. And I feel like these institutions of man and these bureaucracies and these power centers often lead people um, in the wrong direction, even within our church. And I don't say that in a pejorative way or in a critical way or whatever, more of an observation that it, it happens to our church too, that uh, we can't think that just because, quote unquote, the church is true, that there aren't people within the institution of the church who are not uh, using their position of power unrighteously or who are seeking um, their own little agendas and things like that. In fact, you know, church history is full of such examples. Uh, parenthetically, a very interesting book to read if you've never read it, maybe I'll do a whole episode uh, on this later on, is uh, David O. McKay and the Rise of Modern Mormonism. Uh, fan fa fascinating uh, book. Uh, get a little bit of peek behind the curtain into the upper echelons of uh, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at least a few decades ago to kind of see some of the jockeying for power and, and things that uh, were going on. So, okay, let's get into a few examples. And on the flip side, I'll share some thoughts as to what this means and why I have these concerns. But I'm going to start out by sharing some examples. Uh, one of the first ones that comes to mind is uh, when I was working with this former legislator. Excuse me. And uh, this is during the 2012 era. So Mitt Romney is running for president and everyone's all abuzz with a Mormon in the White House. So there was this legislator in Utah, state legislator who was running a bill. And this was a gun bill. It was a pro Second Amendment bill. And his bill was basically saying, hey, federal government, we do not recognize your jurisdiction, your, your gun control stuff. We're going to nullify your gun control uh, laws if you try and pass any in the future or any currently in the present. And in the state of Utah, we're going to protect, you know, Second Amendment rights, gun rights, whatever you want to call them. That was the essence of his bill. So this legislator got a visit from what were called at the time the home teachers, which was the nickname given to the church's two lobbyists that would go 
uh, as a pair up to Capitol Hill and meet with elected officials. So they were nicknamed the home teachers. I don't know, like, there's no real nickname for them anymore. I think they're still just called the home teachers, even though they're not like the ministering brothers. We haven't changed the nickname with the church's uh, change of that program. But anyways, these two show up and they talk to this legislator in the privacy of his office. So this was a private meeting. I was not present for this one. I was present for a lot of these other ones I'll share this is one that was directly related uh, to me by uh, this particular legislator. And he says that they walk in his room and they say, hey, we're really concerned with Mitt Romney running for president because there's this perception that uh, in, in across the country, there's this perception that if we, uh, let me say that again, there's this perception across the nation that the church controls politics in Utah. And if your bill moves forward, this kind of high, it was a highly controversial gun bill, nullification and guns and mixing those together. We're concerned, they said, that if your bill moves forward, then people all across the country with this added attention of Mormonism and politics because of Mitt Romney's race, we're concerned that people are going to see your bill and think that the church was somehow involved. And so, you know, with Mitt running and just the timing of everything, we would prefer that you just kill your bill, not move it forward. And so this legislator sits back in his chair. He's like, wait a minute. You're telling me that because of a perception that the church influences Utah politics, you're here right now in my office trying to influence Utah politics and get me to kill my bill because you're worried about this perception of other people for something that you are claiming that doesn't happen when you're in the middle of making it happen. Very kind of ironic, hypocritical, weird, whatever you want to call it. So that, that's the first one that comes to mind. Um, oh, gosh, I don't even know where to go with some of these. There, there's so many examples. Um, you know, when Medicaid expansion uh, was a big deal um, in Utah years ago, there were people uh, pushing for Medicaid expansion. There was finally the ballot initiative a few years ago. Uh, the church officials were involved in that one, uh, telling uh, legislative leadership, don't block the bill. Uh, trying to to allow a bill to move forward to expand Medicaid, which from my perspective is just total socialism, redistribution of wealth, something that past church leaders have openly criticized the dole and everything else. And so here's these church representatives saying, don't block the bill, talking to leadership, like let the bill move forward um, and, and trying to enable a bill to proceed that would put the state in a precarious financial position all in an effort to increase kind of welfare and uh, reliance upon the government. You may recall a few years ago uh, that the church was very involved in Utah in a supposed compromise between LGBT rights, quote unquote, and uh, religious freedom, quote unquote. And I put quotes around those because I think those terms are loaded and often misleading. Um, I don't think there are LGBT rights. I think there are, are personal rights and property rights and um and religious freedom, I've shared before that I think religious freedom is far too narrow a subset of what we should really be focusing on, because if we focus just on religious freedom to the exclusion of fundamental, you know, like property rights, um, then it's, it's you know, churches saying like, oh, we only want to protect, you know, this freedom, but the rest of you can be screwed and have no one to advocate for you. Uh, and then you get the Pastor Niemöller quote where it's like, you know, I didn't, you know, support them. And then, you know, when I was the only one left, there was no one to support me. So anyways, uh, the church was extremely involved in the anti-discrimination bill. In fact, the church's attorneys basically wrote it. They, there were one, maybe two attorneys who uh, would work out of the Capitol, church attorneys, and, uh, and they would work on drafting with the drafting attorney. They were deeply involved in the drafting of that particular bill. We were very critical of it at the time because um, it, 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 uh, it's problematic. It, it, the church's position was that this is how we can protect religious freedom against the competing um, desires or uh, conflicting rights, uh, competing rights of, you know, LGBTQIA plus triple X, Y, Z, whatever they're called now, people. So the problem is that that's simply not true. The church was saying, OK, well, we're going to say that if you are a landlord, with more than, I think it was 15 units, so like a big apartment complex, then you suddenly lose your rights of association and right to property. And the law is now going to force you to associate with people that you may not want to associate with. It's your property. And if you're an employer and you've got, again, I think it was 15 employees or more, that once you hit this magic arbitrary number, you lose your rights 
and we get to force you to associate with people that you may not want to at your company, at your building, uh, but we're going to force you to do this because, oh, hey, we get to now exclude, you know, BYU and churches and, and churches continue to do whatever they want, but we're going to sell the rest of you out and, and screw over other people who are approaching this from even a religious perspective. Maybe, maybe they feel a religious conviction not to, you know, employ certain people, as is their right, even if you disagree with it. But here's the church saying, as long as we're protected, we're not going to allow anyone else for any religious conviction at all for their business or their, you know, property to exercise those religious freedoms. Only religious institutions are going to have that right. So it was a very myopic bill. But the church was patting itself on the back like crazy. Because they saw this as a way to like ward off the you know supposed threat of these competing rights and the gay activists trying to you know oh, maybe one day we'll be forced to do you know gay wed weddings in the temple or whatever right it was in the middle of all of all of this concern and I think it was very myopic in how they did it but the church was like in the middle of it all there were church leaders that showed up at the press conference it was a star-studded event the governor was there bunch of legislators, church officials, all these kind of gay activists. It was a big kumbaya. And now the church is, is at, up at uh, Congress trying to do the same thing. And I'm not going to be able to share some of the stuff I know about what, what they're doing there. But let's just say I think they are using poor tactics in trying to push a similar bill at the federal level. So the church was very invested in that. But again, I think to the detriment of these fundamental freedoms that they're I think, based on our faith, supposed to be protecting. It was this very much like, give me my ball and I'm going to go home. Like, I only care about myself and church institutions and and, uh, and the rest of you. Like, we're not going to have any protections in there for. Um, so they were, they were in the middle of that. They were writing it. They were advocating for it. And now they, you know, claim that it's this supposed gold standard uh, that they're trying to export across the country. And it's like what they uh, are hanging their hat on politically as, as somehow being this like amazing balance between religious freedom and LGBT rights uh, when I think the whole thing is misguided. Um, and, and so not only is the church kind of like approving it or passively saying like, hey, yeah, that's a, an okay thing we support. Like they're the drivers. They are the ones up at Congress right now pushing it. They are the ones in Arizona and other states like, like this is like top agenda item number one. And, uh, and it's something that they're actively working on. So here in Utah, at the genesis of it, um, they were extremely involved. Uh, I remember an example a few years. They've been heavily involved in alcohol policy over the years, uh, which, which you know, isn't a surprise, I, I don't think, to anyone. I remember a number of years ago, uh, there was a legislator who was trying to go after the Zion Curtain. Do you remember this, like, ridiculous thing in Utah where, like, they had to erect this barrier where to make sure that kids could not see other people drinking. And so it was nicknamed the Zion Curtain. It was this opaque wall that if you wanted to, you know, be serving alcohol, you know, openly to people that you had to have this barrier. And, uh, and so there was this legislator who was trying to get rid of it. Well, what did the church do in response? They wanted this whole PR blitz. They produced a video. They had one of the apostles sit down for the video and do this whole recording. They, you know, did this press. Like they were openly talking about um, that the status quo was fine. And, uh, and, and I mean, even like their actual quote was like, we think things are okay now resisting any attempt to, uh, I would argue, make more rational and common sense and non ridiculous. Some of Utah's alcohol policies and the church, you know, of course, I mean, you know, the history with Heber J grant and everything else, like historically the church was all in for prohibition. Heber J grant was what, took it as a personal insult when so many of the saints in Utah voted to end prohibition, even though there was division in his own, even in the first presidency, there was a disagreement on prohibition, whether it worked or not. And there was Hubie Brown and others who had competing views. And so the church was, I think, split, but you had Heber J. Grant and, and some of his ideological allies who were like supporting the temperance movement and using their church position to like bully the Utah legislature into doing all this prohibitionist stuff. And it continues today, this kind of prohibitionist culture. I'll get into the medical marijuana stuff here shortly that drives a lot of this, including modern alcohol policy and the church's intimate involvement, like almost stranglehold on alcohol policy and not letting anything budge that would you know, allow for a loosening of alcohol laws. This legislator, in fact, was so ticked off with the um, with the home teachers, the church's representatives, when this bill came out, 
he realized, as he told me later, that uh, not just that he realized, he asked them. They had not even read the bill that they were attacking and um, and opposing. They were relying on a summary printed in the Salt Lake Tribune to understand what the bill did rather than actually reading the bill, which, which I think is um, silly. There was another uh, instance where a former Speaker of the House kicked the home teachers out and uh, of, the, of the, the, the Speaker's office and uh, turned to the Chief of Staff and said, I never want them in my uh, office again because they were you know, being kind of deceptive and trying to flex their power um, and the Speaker did not like it. Um, the, oh gosh, there was a gun bill a number of years ago where the church officials uh, came and told the committee chair to shut it down. Uh, there was a, an affirmative action bill that another legislator had to, to basically say, we're going to have fairness. None of this, like, you're black, so we'll give you these extra perks or having these racist policies. This legislator had a bill to say, like, color is blind. We're not going to have any affirmative action in our universities or anything like that. And then the church officials came and told this legislator to drop the bill because Mitt Romney was running for president and they didn't want the controversy, much like that uh, first story uh, I shared. They've been supportive uh, and, and again, driving, um, uh, increasing the, out, the tax on alcohol in Utah. They wanted more money for enforcement. Um, the, I think I'm going to save medical marijuana for the last example, just because I have far more personal uh, insight to share there. And so I'll get there in just a second. Um, the, well, I have personal insight on the polygamy thing too. Um, and this one, here was one where just a couple of years ago, do you remember when there were some leaked uh, interviews of people getting interviewed by their bishop? This was maybe three years ago or something. And it was all, there was a lot of news about these people who would uh, record a kind of bishop conversation where they were, or, or a disciplinary council or whatever, and people were sharing these recordings online and trying to make the church look bad for uh, how these things were handled. And so lo and behold, uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, gets a legislator to run a bill that would make what is currently a two-party recording state. Uh, in other words, if you and I are in a conversation together, I can record our conversation without your permission because I am a party to our conversation. So that's a two-party recording state. Either party can record without needing permission. A uh, single party recording state is basically you need the, per the consent of every single person. Um, you know, even if it's your conversation, you have to clear it. Hey, are you OK? That's why when you, you know, someone does a Zoom recording, because in many other states, they have these single party laws. They need explicit permission. And so everyone on that Zoom call has to say, I'm OK with this and give that explicit consent just because they need to make sure their butts are covered for all the different state laws. But in Utah, we had a two party recording state. You can record anyone. Well, um, so the Chamber of Commerce pushes this law and uh, this bill and says, oh, we want to get rid of that. We want to make it a felony to record anyone in a conversation without their permission. So the legislator runs a bill. We start opposing it and drumming up a lot of um, uh, opposition to it, not knowing at the time, which we soon learned, that when all the heat came on that bill and people were seeing what was going on and we're out there talking about this, uh, how bad this bill is. I mean, think of like a domestic uh, uh, violence victim, right? Hey, you're beating me right now. Can I get your permission to record this so that I can use it as evidence against you? Like ridiculous, right? There's so many instances in which secret recordings are critical, crucial, imperative. And so we were bringing up these examples and talking to people how bad this bill was. And so the legislator's like, oh, I, I'm just running this because the chamber asked me to. I don't know anything about it. So we go to the chamber. Lo and behold, it was the church. That, like, why would the chamber of commerce care about making it a felony to record people in, in conversations? That's not a business issue. No, no, no. The, the chamber is doing it because they talked to someone at the church and the church basically said, hey, we'd like to see this happen. Like, that would be a good thing. We wouldn't oppose it. Like, that's a that, you know thumbs up. Like, that, that works for us. And the chamber kind of took some marching orders and, and went to the behest of the church to make it happen. So they were kind of the patsy. And so the things crumbled really quickly. The legislator's like, oh, I'm dropping the bill. The chamber's like, oh, it's not us. And then it came out that the church was uh, the one that, had, uh, the, you know, they were the reason why this, this bill happened. And to make it a felony, right? To make it a felony for someone to record a, a conversation that they're in. I can't even, 
it's just ridiculous. And, and, uh, and that was the church. Um, okay. Another example. I mean, I'm not going to get into like COVID and masks and, uh, not that there was any specific bill being driven, but even th there's things I know that I wish I could share about, uh, the, the churches, the relationship between the church and the Utah government in how COVID was handled. I'll just say in a very abstract sense that things are not as they seem in terms of how the church was speaking out and encouraging um, uh, people to get the, the jab, um, that there was kind of a connection between uh, the government and, and the church there. Um, okay, back to something I do have firsthand information about. Uh, polygamy, right? You may remember a few years ago, we wanted to make polygamy, um, uh, we wanted to, to decriminalize polygamy. And the issue is you look at like the Warren Jeffs of the world, these, these horrific abusers, and they were specifically allowed to rise to power because they could lord over their people, their criminal status, keep them in the shadows and say, if you report anything, they're going to come and take your kids away. They're going to take your, your husband away. You know, these are felons. They've done it before decades ago. And so, you know, you got to keep quiet. You got to keep your head down. And so that that climate fostered Warren Jeffs to rise and people didn't want to come out and report and talk to law enforcement, have their kids in hospitals, their babies, uh, you know, uh, go work at different companies. Like they didn't want the scrutiny because they were worried that if someone found out they were polygamists, or if someone found out anything that law enforcement could use, they could use their their status as a polygamist to get in and do a a search of the home, right? Because they're they're a felon, they're clearly breaking the law. So now you get in the home, you see what all all else they're doing, and so it, it was the status of the law that allowed this to happen. So we wanted to say we need to get rid of this law completely. Any abuse can remain illegal. Any problems go after the problems, not the marital status or the religious, you know cohabitation uh, between family members. So we start working on this. We, we worked on it for a number of years and the church fought it again and again. I should have pulled up. I should have been uh, prepared for this, but there was a quote uh, that the, from the church about them uh, supporting the status quo. They did not, the, the statement from their spokesperson was like something to the effect of, we're worried about the signal that is sent if we lower the the criminal position for these uh for these individuals we don't like the message that is being sent and so you know we try we, we have a bill and it's lowering polygamy uh trying to lower the the penalty and then we got out of the committee then there's another legislator who runs an amendment to raise it back up to a felony which at the time a few years ago passed and you know the church lo and behold is behind that and uh and, and just all this like and the sponsor of the bill uh you know, and, and of next year's bill to make it like there were multiple bills, but like the sponsor was driving this because the you know church is supportive and and all this stuff, right? The church did not want the PR, they did not want the image problem, so they were okay felonizing all of these completely otherwise innocent law-abiding people because they didn't want the the PR, they did not want the image, the association between Utah and these uh, the LDS church and these kind of offshoot uh, polygamist um, varieties sects, um, always a weird word to try and say, to enunciate, uh, enunciate the T, sects. <laughs> and uh, and so they, they didn't want the image, they didn't want the PR, therefore they supported a, a, a law, a bill to recriminalize polygamy, to make it a felony, to continue to criminalize these people, to perpetuate the conditions in which Warren Jess was allowed to rise. And so uh, we finally were able to push enough that uh, we got a bill passed um, a couple years ago. Now, Lieutenant Governor Dieter Henderson was the sponsor and uh, we were finally able to overcome some of those concerns and uh, the position of the church and got them to a point of, I guess you'd call it neutrality, just of like, like stay out of it. Like this isn't a church issue. We kept them in the loop. We were updating them on what we were doing, but always trying to get them to be like, stay on the sidelines, stay on the sidelines, don't engage, don't say anything, just, let this be a policy issue. Don't get involved. And, um, and so that, that was one where there was a lot of involvement and, you know, understandably so because polygamy is very connected to the church, obviously in Utah. Uh, but still like I could just not tolerate the, um, the, the direct desire and influence to perpetuate a felony crime for people who just happen to live like, 
you know, people like Hugh Hefner or whatever, right? People are sleeping around all the time. And like suddenly if you want to love and care for those people and the children that you father, that's a felony and we're going to crush you. But like, hey, if you're sleeping around and whatever, like, you know, no big deal. And we're just going to not do anything about it. It's just totally backwards. So, um, okay, final final one I'll share that I have direct knowledge of. There certainly are others. I mean, even water. The church is the biggest um, consumer of water. All the all the you know fields and church buildings and everything. The biggest property owner and, and land, a water consumer. And we've fought efforts in the past to uh, change the way water policy is done. Right now, um, you know, people are incentivized to use way more water than they need to because they're not actually paying for it. They're not, they're not having to pay for the water they use. They're paying like these flat rates. And then that's you, why you go outside and it's raining and you see, you know, a church building with its sprinklers going off or whatever. Cause like they don't feel the pain. We don't feel the pain. So we need to shift how water is uh, used in a desert state. Uh, but the church, uh, their, you know, whatever their department person is over this, like they've always resisted that they want to keep the status quo. So, so, you know, you could say, well, they're a property holder, like like any property uh, owner, if they had a lot of property owner, they would have a vested interest. I have never been one to say that the church cannot uh, lobby. It clearly has its own interests uh, as a large landowner and employer and all these things. Um, it makes sense. Um, some people feel like the church should not, uh, that it should be illegal for the church to be involved. But the church is a nonprofit, just like Libertas Institute and many other nonprofits who are all affected by policy. They have every constitutional and legal right to engage in the process, to lobby even, to make their positions known. That's all well and good. It's just different when you claim to speak for God. It's just different when the, you know, overwhelming majority of the legislature are members of your organization. It's different when you claim kind of, or, or enjoy this perception of divine backing behind everything that you do. And that certainly played out in the case of medical cannabis. So some of you may know our organization was responsible for making this happen after a five year uh, campaign with uh, some allies and friends. And when we first started, we had a bill with uh, Senator Mark Manson and uh, and interestingly enough, he is the grandson of Ezra Taft Benson. And uh, so he's you know a big kind of Bensonite kind of guy himself. And he wanted to legalize medical cannabis. So we teamed up and worked on it. And I believe it was the second year that we worked on it uh, with him. We were making some progress, but then we were starting to hear that some of the fence sitting legislators were backing off, were changing their mind, not willing to support the bill, and we needed their votes to make this happen. Lo and behold, the home teachers were on the hill and uh, they were going to speak to leadership. Now here's what happens, a lot of people, sponsors of the bill even, they'll stand up and they'll say, oh, I haven't talked to the church at all. You know, no one at the church has contacted me. That's not, the church does not do what Libertas does and other groups where you have to go talk to every single elected official and you have to build consensus and all these things, right? Historically, no, 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 no. Because that, that would be too overt. It would be too public. It would be too distasteful to see them with all of us lay lobbyists, you know, standing outside, waiting to talk to people, trying to get them to come talk to you, to be able to listen to you. No, no, no. That is, you know, beneath the dignity and the, the position of the church. They don't do any of that. You, you'll never see them out in the public doing the work in an open and transparent way. Historically, what always happened is that they'll arrange direct meetings. They'll go in and meet with leadership or a committee chair. They'll make a phone call and they'll have kind of direct uh, leverage to shut a bill down or, or make their position known. So it's very hush-hush and uh, and behind the scenes. So um, so we find out that that's what's happening with medical cannabis. They had just met with the Speaker of the House and told them that we don't want this bill, that this medical cannabis bill that Senator Madison's doing, and they were about to meet with the Senate President. So uh, they were finally willing to meet with Senator Madison. And so it was myself, Senator Madison and his intern, and the two home teachers. And they were there to tell Senator Madsen the church's position that they opposed the bill and let him know that they were meeting with leadership to convey their opposition, which of course, for anyone in Utah who's Mormon and in politics, like they don't even need to say, oh, the, the President Nelson or who, you know, Thomas Monson at the time, like 
the president of the church has, has come here to direct me to tell you to kill the bill. Like, no, no, no. It's, it's plausible deniability, right? Like, it's none of that. It's, it's just making the position known. The church's position is this. We feel this. The brethren at the highest levels. I can't tell you how many times in that meeting uh, they, they said, oh, this comes from the, the highest levels of the church. Well, what does that mean? The highest level? The highest, like, who signed off on this? What was the conversation? Did they... No, they, they wouldn't share names. They wouldn't do anything. It was always that kind of plausible deniability. It was the highest levels of the church. And, and of course, when you convey that to someone who's a faithful member of the church and the Senate president or the Speaker of the House, they don't need to be told, you know, the president wanted me to tell you to kill. Like, no, no. When you say the president of your church wants this done, by and large, those politicians are going to be willing to do that even if they are not directly asked for that to be done, with exceptions, right? There are exceptions, but I think as a general rule, that is the pattern, and the church knows that that is what they, the, the, the power that they can leverage. That's how they can wield this, this power and get what they want without having to be explicit, without having to have any documentation, anything that could be subjected to an open records request, any of this kind of stuff. They convey the position and the implication that hey, you need to do or we expect you to do what our position is. So we're sitting in Senator Madsen's office and they're telling us, here's the position of the, the leaders of the church at the highest levels. And we had this big green binder that uh, we had created like five of them. It was this binder full of studies showing the promising potential of medical cannabis, sorted by condition and all these things, right? And the point was like, look, the science is there. For whatever reason, the FDA, FDA is, you know, behind or whatever, like we can get into all that. But the point was like, this can help people. Here's the science to back it up. Can we present this to someone? I, I asked directly. I said, I was like, okay, that's nice that you guys have your position, but like we've never been able to talk to you. We want, who's making this decision? Can we talk to them? Can I, can we set up, I, I asked, can we set up a meeting with one or two of the general authorities so that we can make this case? Immediately, the answer was no. And it wasn't done in a friendly way. It was done in a very derogatory and arrogant way. I mean, the, you can understand the, the climate of this room was not one of uni um, union and brotherhood, right? Like, I did not feel the spirit in that room at all. It was uh, tense nerves and a lot of frustration. And I was like, can we please meet with someone? And nope, that won't be happening. I was just shut down. No consideration, no... No desire to learn, no desire for discussion. Just, we're not talking to you. This is our position. We're just here to tell you about it. Which was basically signaling to us that the bill was dead, which it was uh, as a result of the church making this position known. And I, Senator Madsen's trying to kind of like, oh, but what about this? And what if we did this? And what, you know, he's like probing a little bit. And I, I said, okay, hang up. I want to share a story with you. And I don't even remember what story it was, but I shared a story of a patient who was like, you know, terminal, um, I believe, in their, their illness. And I said, we are trying to do this for people like that who don't have a lot of hope. They've used like a bajillion pharmaceuticals that aren't helping them, making matters worse with all the side effects. This person is a, a faithful Latter-day Saint. They don't want to break the law because plenty of people who needed the relief were just going and using it illegally, right? And just um, assuming that risk to do so. But as like here are faithful Latter-day Saints who have been raised and conditioned to be good law-abiding citizens, and you're telling them that they are, you are going to be an impediment to stand in their way to get the relief and the medication that they need. We're doing it for these people. Can you not see that like there are suffering people that need this, and we need to figure out a way to do it? And they had no response. They just sat there like cold machine, whatever, like like it's cyborgs. I mean, like no. No compassion, no, like, look, I understand, you know, I, we, we know why you guys are doing this. We can understand you have, you know, good intentions, blah, blah. It was, it was disgusting. Like, I, I did not um, enjoy that meeting at all. And um, so the meeting ended, and, uh, and that was that. The, they went and communicated to the Senate president, and, and the bill was dead. And that was my first extremely uh, up-close glimpse into how this stuff works and uh, how the church will use its influence when it wants to. And I was very disgruntled. But that was not the end. That was only the beginning. Because as most of you know, we went out and did a ballot initiative 
which became Proposition 2. And this was in 2018. Gosh, it's been four years since we were in the middle of this campaign. And so we took it to the people. We said, you know what? The, the polling numbers are there. The public supports this. We raised over a million bucks. We got gathered a hundred and whatever, 30 some odd thousand signatures from people all over the state. And what was very interesting to me, this was also very enlightening, was that the church didn't want to talk to us, I believe, because we didn't have leverage. We, we, we didn't have the ability to credibly damage the image of, of the church or its position. So then we went out and got that leverage. When all of a sudden, what we were trying to do was a threat and not a request, because before it was like, mother, may I, legislature, may I please, will, will you please legalize this? And the church could go in, you know, the officials, and they could just make their phone calls, their meetings with the right people and shut it down. But when we had leverage on our side, that created a different dynamic. And suddenly this issue was, was a threat to their position. And so, gosh, what's the, the Reader's Digest version of all of this? Um, I'll start here. Proposition 2 was attacked and opposed by the entire establishment in Utah. The governor, legislative leadership, law enforcement, the Chamber of Commerce, the Teachers Union, the Utah Medical Association, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They held a press conference where a bunch of these, you know, coalition leaders stood up on a stage and were attacking Proposition 2, which I felt was like my baby. You know, I'm, I'm a face for this thing. I, I wrote like so much of that, that uh, of the proposition of the draft. Like I had my hands all up and down and inside this thing. And here's my church attacking what, what we were doing. And uh, I'm trying to remember which came first. So that we had, we had the press conference, but right around then... The church issued a, a memo attacking Proposition 2. They did it through their law firm, Curtin McConkie, uh, which is the kind of law firm that they use for all their legal stuff. So they issued this memo, and it's, it says, rebuttal of Proposition 2. Um, and, uh, and so, or no, theirs didn't say rebuttal. It was like uh, a criticism of Proposition 2 or something like that. And it was this like three or four page memo where they kind of, picked apart the ballot proposition. Oh, it's bad because of this, and it's federally illegal, and blah, 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 blah. And so I, I'm reading this thing when they publish it, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking to all my attorney friends, and everyone is just disgusted with this memo because it, the summary of all the criticism was that it was written by, like, like a first-year intern. Like, it just was not written well. The arguments were not well-formed. They were not fair criticisms of our position or the ballot initiative. It just was a poor attempt to attack what we were doing. And so the running joke was that like, you know, the Curtin McConkie folks were like, eh, we don't want to touch this. And so they had one of their little interns write this up and put it out. So I sit down and I write on Libertas letterhead, a rebuttal to the Curtin McConkie memo. And line by line, I take their responses. And, and I'm not an attorney. I just play one on TV. Like I, I can, I always tell my attorney friends, like I can do almost everything you do. I just don't have the school debt to show for it. And so, like, I, I'm pretty good at, you know, uh, making a go of, of, you know, legal arguments and analysis. And so I write up this whole memo and this rebuttal to their memo, and we publish it. And people are sharing it like crazy, right? And it kind of, like, made the rounds. And so then it was like a week later or something that we got, it was titled, Rebuttal to the Rebuttal. <laughs> by Libertas Institute. And so they came out and it was just so awkward and poorly done. And so I was just like, I'm not going to keep this going. Like I've spoken my piece and we'll leave it there. But here's the church through their legal arm, like attacking what we're doing. Meanwhile, they, you know, they're doing this press conference that I mentioned. And then it was right around then. In fact, I have the date right here, August 23rd, 2018. So this was after the press conference and after the memo. And uh, this is what, like two and a half months before the vote because we had gotten enough signatures. And so now it's certified on the ballot. The church knows it's coming. We can't take it off the ballot. There's no provision to do that. So now they're facing this, this kind of threat that what they killed in the legislature now has legs and the people are about to vote on it. And so then I get this email. Maybe some of you got it too if you live in Utah. 
the Area Authority of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints sent an email to all members in the entire state urging them to, to vote against Proposition 2. This was the first time that I've been able to validate with, I, I talked to so many people, like no, no one can recall anything like this ever being done before where the church used its email directory of members to email them and say, here's this political action we want you to take. I'm gonna read you this email. So this is uh, August 23rd, 2018. And, and here's the, for those who, who uh, are looking online, you can see right here, it says official church announcement in the heading of the email. So this is an official church announcement. Dear brothers and sisters, in November, Proposition 2, an initiative which would legalize the sale and use of marijuana, doesn't say anything about medical, they're trying to insinuate that it's not, will appear on the ballot. Its proponents, hi, that's me, proponent, its proponents assert that it will make medical marijuana available to those suffering with debilitating pain and other infirmities. However, in truth, it goes much further, creating a serious threat to health and public safety, especially for our youth and young adults, by making marijuana generally available, generally available, with few controls. The church joins a coalition of medical experts, public officials, and community stakeholders in calling for a safe and compassionate approach to providing medical marijuana to those in need. The church does not object to the medicinal use of marijuana if doctor prescribed in dosage form through a licensed pharmacy. I'll talk about that in just a second. As a member of the coalition, we urge voters of Utah to vote capital letters NO on Proposition 2, that's all in bold. And join us in a call to state elected officials to promptly work with medical experts, patients, and community leaders to find a solution that will work for all Utahns without the harmful effects that will come to pass if Proposition 2 becomes law. For more information on Proposition 2, please refer to this legal analysis prepared for the church by Curtin McConkie. <laughs> that's the memo I spoke of just a moment ago. Signed with signature right there, Elder Craig C. Christensen, president of the Utah area. So this email gets blasted out and, and Latter-day Saints are now being mobilized by their church to vote against Proposition 2. They're being told in this PR propaganda spin that Proposition 2 is basically recreational marijuana. Oh, it's okay, we support medical marijuana. If doctor prescribed, doctors can't prescribe it. It's federally illegal. They can't prescribe things that are federally illegal in dosage form and in licensed pharmacies. Licensed pharmacies can't touch federally uh, illegal things. So the statement itself was a non-starter because the conditions that they described were not possible. So this email was blasted out. So here I am, active member of my faith whose baby, political baby, if you will, my, my project that me and my team are working on is being attacked again and again and again by my church, wielding their political authority overtly and publicly in ways that they never have before in the modern era when we have email and the ability to, you know, they've, they've done stuff through the Deseret News and editorials and they, they've, they've done public things in the past to tell people how to vote. That is not new. What's new is this direct communication to, I don't know what, hundreds of thousands of, of people all across Utah voters. So that was uh, an interesting experience. Um, the, the rest of the story I think is fairly well known. We ultimately decided to negotiate with our opposition. It ended up being uh, myself and my vice president at the time, DJ, who was overseeing uh, the, the signature gathering and a lot of the logistics of the campaign. So it's he and I, and the Speaker of the House, and the church's uh, lobbyist, who was a former Speaker of the House. Interestingly, when the Speaker of the House was a freshman first coming in, the church's uh, lobbyist was the Speaker of the House. So they knew each other well in that regard. This individual is now the church's lobbyist. I mean, it's kind of like how like Pfizer you know, people will then be at the FDA and then FDA people will leave and then <laughs> go to Moderna or, you know, Pfizer or whatever. You get this like revolving door. So anyways, he's, he's the church's lobbyist. And the four of us are in that room hatching what would become the foundation of the 
compromise. Now, what's interesting is that, that uh, and, and look, we do this too. Sometimes we work on political things that the public does not know about. We intentionally work through other organizations or, or get other people to be the face of something because it's more advantageous for the issue. The church does this too. I have firsthand knowledge on Proposition 2, how they were recruiting the coalition, how they were involved reaching out to people and building this coalition because the church did not want to be alone. The church did not want to be the primary face of the opposition to medical cannabis. They wanted the comfort of having other people involved. And so on the flip side, when we got done negotiating the whole agreement, we had a press conference and we're in the gold room at the Capitol, the big fancy hoopla and the governor's there and the speaker and the Senate president and myself and DJ and uh, Elder, I think, Gerard or Rasban, I can't remember. One of the church representatives, uh, general authorities was there to say some words and say, hey, we support this, you know, compromise. And then who sat next to me? It was the... I don't, sorry, I don't know titles. He's like the chief pastor guy of like the Episcopalian church or something like that. And, uh, and he's sitting next to me. And I think he went up and he said some words too. I'm pretty sure this guy is, <laughs> I felt so bad for him. He was window dressing. He had zero involvement in the entire thing. None, none at all. And yet he's there in this grand kind of compromise announcement. Why? Image. Because the, the church did not want to be perceived as like, here's, here's the medical marijuana people, here's the government, and then here's the LDS church. That was the image that they didn't want. They wanted the image of a coalition, right? So the perception would be different. So that the perception would be that the church does not control Utah politics. So they got this poor little patsy guy to sit next to me, I think, say a few words, uh, when he had no involvement at all, none. Wasn't relevant to the discussion at all. It was there for image to show that this was a, you know, bigger thing than it was, bigger coalition, more people weighing in than just the LDS church using its influence when that's not actually the truth. Makes you wonder how many other times things like that happen. And I can say quite confidently they um, happen a lot. So, so yeah, okay, so there's lots of examples. And, and so the question is, why, why do I care? Why am I doing this musing? And the reason is because I, I don't subscribe to the idea that the church should stay silent. In fact, on some issues, I wish the church would be anything but silent, like abortion, which I'll save for a future musing. So I don't believe the church should be silent. I think the church should use its influence prudently and correctly. And so I believe that the church often uses its position wrongly, that it leverages its power for the wrong reasons, for image. Shut, shut down that bill. We don't want this perception that, we don't want people to think this way about the church. So we're gonna be here and interfere with politics. Or we, we want the image of, you know, having tight liquor control and not having Utah be like so many other states where, you know, responsible adults can, heaven forbid, you know, get a drink without jumping through all these silly hurdles and so forth, right? It's, it's image. It's, um, it's wrong. It's, it's a desire to enact a moral standard through the punitive arm of Caesar rather than teaching correct principles and letting them govern themselves. It's a desire to shape community using the implements of Caesar rather than through persuasion and, and teaching and principle. It's, it's using the coercive arm of government. And I think that's wrong for our church to do because I think, as is no surprise to anyone who watches or listens to these things that I do, right? I think that is inconsistent with our faith, with our doctrine. I don't think that our church should be doing these things. I welcome the church going out there and teaching principles. I welcome the church using its bully pulpit to, to further moral causes, 100%. Using persuasion and, and convincing people and sharing what God has said, all these things are fantastic. We need more of them. We need more moral strength coming from the pulpit 
of, and, and here's where people are like, oh, you're trying to study the ark and tell them what they should say or whatever. I'm, I'm not. I'm just saying I would welcome that. And I think it would be consistent with the doctrines of our faith to be advocating for things or against things more often and, and expressing these views and teaching these things. But when things are done quietly and behind the scenes and, and they're, you know, phone calls placed and shut this down and, you know, we're going to negotiate this and we're going to send an email to every member and tell them how they should vote and all these things. I think that exceeds the bounds of the way that this power should be used. Because again, it's implied that this power is from God. It's implied that when this comes from the highest levels of the church, it's, it's being intentionally implied that it comes from God. That your bill, helping, medical, helping patients who want medical cannabis, your bill has to die because the highest levels have said so, and therefore God has said so. Church officials know that this is the impression, especially in Utah. They know that this is the interpretation of their actions. And so in my mind, it would suggest a need for even more reticence, even more caution to use such power. To, to not do it for something like medical cannabis. I mean, good grief, like, <laughs> oh, how much do I want to share? Like, like through amendments and subsequent years, the medical cannabis law it now basically says almost exactly with, with minimal differences what it said in Proposition 2, except now the church supported the compromise and now they're out of the issue. So it's like, why do that at all? Because I can't tell you how many people I had conversations with when all that was happening whose testimonies were, were shaken to their core when they saw the church get political right? Get, get kind of down and dirty and telling people how to vote and standing up on stages and saying things using PR spin about, you know, Proposition 2 and just getting in the middle of these things that these people struggled. They're like, what is my church doing? My, you know, for example, mother-in-law had cancer and this was the only thing that would help. My grandma has debilitating arthritis. She rubs this on her knuckles at night and it makes her quality of life way better. Like, why is my church doing this? And I had so many conversations with people to help them understand, like, look, this isn't new. They've done it before. They'll do it again. They're doing it for whatever these reasons. Like, don't let that affect your faith. This is just men using their power in ways I don't think that they should. I don't think this is from God. So just stomach that. Get to a point where you can kind of separate God from even well-intentioned people who might be doing things the wrong way. And you'll be okay, at least. I mean, I hold those views and I think I'm okay. But but people struggled deeply. And and the church's image was was is tarnished the right word? I don't know if that implies like a permanent thing. But like the church's reputation that they were so worried about the image and everything, I think was damaged. Because it doesn't cultivate good faith to come in and like be like leveraging your power, throwing your weight around, telling people how to vote or shutting down bills or, you know, writing bills the way you want that. Like when, when these things become public, when people learn about the, the intimacy of the involvement of the church at times, historically, I think things might be changing a little, maybe. I'm not so confident, but maybe. Probably not, but maybe. But historically, at least, the church has, has leveraged its power this way, and I don't think it cultivates goodwill among members of the church or outsiders. What was the reason why the saints were so persecuted in Nauvoo and the other communities that they lived in? It was because the threat that they posed to people's political power. The locals did not like all these Mormons like wielding their power. They're going to put Mormon judges in and a Mormon sheriff and blah, 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 right? It was the source of the consternation and the conflict against the saints. So now that we dominate here in Utah, why would we, why would we use our pol political power in a way that would alienate and, and undermine the, the, the rights of people who have nothing to do with our church, right? Like it's not a good look. And I don't think it's consistent with our faith. I mean, I talk about that in more depth in Christ versus Caesar about what it actually means to love one another 
in a political context. And using Caesar to get what you want and more taxes here and more control there and you know less restrictions there and oh you're you're a landlord oh no you got 15 people you get no rights anymore but don't worry we don't have to you know uh, have gay people at BYU but you do you know like all that kind of stuff is just icky and i think it is beneath the church's mission and and i think the church can teach correct principles and let the rest of us figure it out in legislatures and city councils across the state it's very interesting talking to my think tank friends from other states about the challenges that they face and the obstacles that are in their path. And when I talk to them about me, a member of my ch- uh, the LDS church, fighting my own church again and again, being at odds uh, politically with the church's position on things, like they just can't even understand that. It's just hard for them to <laughs> fathom fighting a church uh, for, you know, free market and, and, you know, libertarian type policies. It's, it's a very interesting thing. Admittedly, it's, it's a weird road for me to navigate as a faithful member of the church and to find myself at, at political odds because yeah, let's keep polygamists felons, or let's make felons out of people who are recording a conversation they're a part of, or, you know, let's deny people access to these things or let adults get, you know, drinks or get wine delivered to their home in a wine club, like big whoop, right? Let, let's let the church rise above. Let's focus on much loftier and important things than getting drugged down into the dirty fights on Capitol Hill. Leave that up to the rest of us who signed up for that, who aren't doing it in any association with our faith. Uh, but for the church itself to do that introduces too many variables, too many challenges, and, and too much collateral damage of people who observe this, both the outsiders who are disgusted by, you know, the church wielding its political power that way, but also the members who disagree. Members who are like, I, I don't agree with that. I don't think I should be, you know, vaccinated with COVID despite you urging, or I don't think that marijuana should be illegal and we should criminalize people for consuming a plant that God has provided for us with prudence and thanksgiving, right? And so members who have a disagreement and find themselves at odds with these political positions, then I think many times start to question their faith or question the church or question the prophet and question, question, question in not good ways. And and it's because the church got involved in the first place and stepped in it that creates all this collateral damage that I think is unnecessary. I think the church can fulfill its mission and and do what it needs to do in in ways that do not require it to engage politically like this, to be lobbying for things, to be doing things behind the scenes, to be influencing and building fake coalitions to preserve their image in different ways. I just think all of that is unnecessary. I wish it would stop. And uh, and I hope for a future in which the church is more tightly focused on You know, the things I think that it ought, rather than some of these things that I've personally seen and heard about um, that I think don't really win friends, don't really produce good outcomes in the long run, and create a whole lot of problems along the way. So I don't know what the next decade holds, but the past decade has been a little weird. It's been unfortunate in this, uh, this situation of finding myself politically at odds with this powerful institution of which I'm a member. And uh, I hope that things will change a little bit. I hope that Proposition 2 was a bit of a learning experience for the church in seeing the public so supportive of medical cannabis and so frustrated with the church's involvement. And I hope that's kind of like, a, Ooh, like let's not do that again and let's, let's uh, keep our powder dry and not um, do things the way we have been done in the past. I think it'll be better for the church. I think it'll be better for members. It'll be better for their... Um, their kind of presence in the community and people who are not of our faith to uh, see them having the power, but restraining themselves from using it. I think that'd be a win-win for everyone and we'll see what the next decade holds. Hope you guys have a great Sunday.